morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we are going to get started here because we are webcasting today, and I know that there are people watching, and I want to greet them. And I want to also give a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today at the Advancing Women's Civil Society Organizations in Security Sector Reform panel discussion. Before we begin, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kathleen Keenest. I direct the Gender and Peacebuilding Center here at the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, for those of you who may be new to the U.S. Institute of Peace, which is a very long name, so we go USIP as a shortcut. Um, the Institute uh, was founded and mandated by Congress 28 years ago to really be our country's um, conflict resolution uh, think and do tank is what we say. Uh, we practice uh, on the ground and we also uh, do research, teaching, and training to look at nonviolent means to resolve international conflict. We are very excited today to have what we have long considered two really capable partners in the area of not only security sector reform, but gender and peace building. So to me, today is like a party. <laughs> and uh, we get to celebrate uh, with the gift of a new guide, a woman's guide to security sector reform. And you will hear from two of the authors this morning. They will be introduced shortly, Megan Bostic and Toby Whitman. We're going to talk about this intersection, an intersection that certainly is one in which DCAF, mm -hmm. otherwise known as the Geneva Center for the Democratic Control of Armed Forces, is really one of the world's leading institutions in the area of security sector reform and security sector governance. We will also hear from the Institute for Inclusive Security, which is one of the leading civil society organizations that has been addressing for over a decade the issue of women, peace, and security. We will have members uh, from each of the three institutions uh, on the panel, so I think we'll have a great discussion, and we really look to you uh, in our audience for key questions and comments during the Q&A session. So without any further delay, I would like to invite our colleague Anya Ebnota of the DCAF organization. She is the assistant director and the head of operations, and she is also a member of its directing board in shaping the future strategy of the DCAF Center. She's going to say a few opening remarks. We want to welcome you uh, from uh, Geneva. And uh, we look forward to all of your participation. And in another moment, I'll introduce our key moderator here. So, Anya. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Uh, I would like to thank Kathleen Kuyanast uh, and USIP for having agreed to host this event. Our relationship goes back a number of years, and we feel very privileged to be here again today and introduce an issue which is close to our hearts and in front of so many of you here today. Before I very briefly introduce our in organization, I would also like to thank our friends from the Institute for Inclusive Security. We have on and off over the past years worked together and exchanged information and met each other at important events on women, peace and security this is the first real product that we have done together. And I'm very pleased that we did it, and I'm very proud of it. And on a, ver on a very personal level, to collaborate with friends makes life so much nicer and easier. So who is DCAF? We do provide in-country advisory support and practical assistance programs. We develop and promote democratic norms at international, regional, and national levels. We advocate good practices and make policy recommendations to ensure effective democratic governance of the security sector. 
We are an international foundation founded by the Swiss government, composed of currently 61 member countries, among which, as one of the founding members, is the United States. We are 13 years old. Our headquarters are in Geneva, Switzerland, but we do have offices in Tunis, in Ramallah, in Brussels, Belgrade, and Ljubljana. So I don't think I have to go into what is the security sector, but we have a very wide uh, interpretation of who the security sector is. It's, those, it's not only those who carry arms and those who oversee, oversee meaning the ministries, but also the parliaments, the parties, the media, us, civil society, every reasonable citizen of any given country. And what, how we interpret security sector reform is the process of transformation of the security sector to manage and operate a system consistent with democratic norms and principles of good governance and to strengthen the accountability, the effectiveness, the respect for human rights and rule of law. Including a gender perspective in SSR programs is today recognized as a necessary contribution to operational effectiveness of security sector institutions. I only mention a few key words to describe how we see the world and the world of security sector reform before I hand over to those who have actually written the publication that we are launching today. Effective service delivery. Women, men, girls and boys have different views and different needs. Not taking those differences into account when talking about security sector reform is leaving 50% behind. Representation. A nation state, a population of any country, consists of roughly 50% men and women of different ethnies, race, religion, languages. You trust any state institution more if your view is represented there somewhere, somehow. Respect for human rights. Seems self-explanatory, but is not self-evident. Measures to prevent and respond to human rights violations need to be a part of any SSR process, be it codes of conduct, sexual harassment policies, independent oversights and complaints mechanisms. Local ownership. Security is sensitive, touches on sovereignty of a state. As an international NGO, it means it's your security, not ours. You say where you want to go, not we but it also means including all parts of the population, including women's organizations. Oversight and accountability. <coughs> Equal participation of men and women in oversight bodies like parliaments, the judiciary and ombuds institutions make sure that the concerns of the populations are taken up and committed violations and abuses are prevented or at least punished. What brings us here today is exactly that the expertise in oversight, in governance, in reform processes of sectorial reforms, working with civil society and integrating a gender perspective into all that should in the end strengthen transparent, accountable, efficient, democratic security institutions that respect human rights and the rule of law. And how this new publication can help us achieving that, or at least one sector, that's what we're going to hear now. Thank you. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce colleague and friend, Jackie O'Neill, who directs the Institute for Inclusive Security. I remember the first time I heard Jackie speak, it was at our old building on M Street, and I didn't know who this Jackie O'Neill was. And I remember talking to one of my neighbors and saying, who is she? She knows so much and she has so much experience on the ground on security sector reform. And here we are five years later, <laughs> many, many projects and programs later. And I'm really pleased to turn the podium over to our moderator this morning, Jackie O'Neill, who will then introduce our panelists. Thank you, Jackie, for all your thoughts. Yes, thank you, Kathleen, and thanks, Anya, and welcome, everyone. Thanks, Anya, especially for setting up uh, our conversation so perfectly so that we can get right into it. Um, as Kathleen said, I direct the Institute for Inclusive Security, and for those of you who don't know us, our mission is to increase the inclusion of women in peace negotiations worldwide. And uh, just as uh, DCAF has a broad definition of the security sector, we have a broad definition of peace processes. And so we 
include getting women to the table of peace negotiations themselves and ensuring that they're prepared to be effective once they're there, as well as ensuring women are present and active in all aspects of implementing a peace agreement, which of course includes security sector reform. And so we work with various institutions, the US government, NATO, the UN, and others to refine doctrine, to review policies and practices, to document case studies, uh, to uh, actually do training of uniform and civilian personnel about why and uh, very specifically how to work with women in local areas of conflict uh, to strengthen security sector reform itself. So as Anya said, we've worked with DCAF for many years and you know, I was trying to describe our relationship with USIP. We're basically here once a week. We almost have an office uh, either in, shared with yours or here in this auditorium. So uh, we work very closely together and we're also very proud members of the US Civil Society Working Group on Women, Peace and Security. And I know member, many of the other members are represented here today, so thank you for that. Uh, we've got, uh, we've had since we launched with DCAF the Women's Guide a few weeks ago, we've been really pleasantly surprised with the response that we've gotten. Uh, and Megan and Toby will talk a lot more about some of that and some of the rollout. Uh, already plans for launches in Bosnia and Afghanistan, Libya, and several other places. Um, but we've also gotten great feedback from policy shapers and policy makers who've really been interested uh, in and not just working with women in civil society for the sake of it, but really actually strengthening security sector reform. And that's why we're excited about this conversation today, and I think that's why this guide has resonated, is because there are a lot of people out there who say that they want to, they've started to identify the very specific and practical benefits to working with women in civil society, and they understand that this gender issue or this idea of working with women is not separate and it's not separatable from the rest of the process. And that's what we're hoping to talk about Today we had, um, we had a number of great responses already. Uh, DCAF in its diligence has been collecting a list of all the, the responses that we've gotten. We had one fantastic one from our, one of the Women Waging Peace Network members in Liberia, Ruth Caesar, who wrote to us, all of my dreams have come true. And that was our entire response to the, the Women's Guide. So no pressure there. Uh, but Ruth was one of the uh, original civil society uh, reviewers of this guide. And one of the things that she's constantly emphasized and which I think we're seeing in the discussions uh, and the interest today is that we're, we're really starting to shift the perception away from women as exclusively victims of conflict who need protection by security forces to the notion that women are stakeholders in this reform process who have very important insights, information, and contributions to make. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our panelists. And uh, I'll go through introductions of all of them, throw out some questions, and then we'll have a discussion. And by the end, we'll move to a question and answer session. So I thought I'd start with our guest who at least travels regularly from furthest away, uh, Rangina Hamidi. Rangina grew up in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the United States. She's an entrepreneur. She's the founder and president, I think now creative director, of Kandahar Treasure, which was the first women's private enterprise in Kandahar province in Afghanistan. Rangina is ideal for this panel as she has personally organized groups of women to interact with NATO forces as well as with Afghan military and personal per, or police, excuse me. And I've had the very good fortune of being uh, with Rangina at a number of meetings and events uh, in DC in particular, and remember one, where we were on Capitol Hill not too long ago and had a meeting with uh, several members of Congress. And at the end, Nancy Pelosi leaned over to her and I think grabbed your arm and said, Rangina, I will never forget what you just told me. So again, no pressure, Rangina, to <laughs> be at that level. Uh, we're also very delighted to have two experts here from USIP, uh, Bob Perito, who I'm sure has also said many things that Nancy Pelosi will never forget. Um, Bob is the director of the Center for Government Governance, or Center of Innovation for Security Sector Governance here at USIP, and was for many years also a Foreign Service Officer, uh, and worked six years as Deputy Director of the International Police Training Program at the Department of Justice. Uh, Bob has written extensively about security sector reform, security sector issues, and police in particular, including I think the recently reissued uh, Where is the Lone Ranger? America's Search for a Stability Force and The American Experience with Police in Peace Operations, published by the Canadian Peacekeeping Press, ironically. So as a Canadian, I'm interested to see that we are, we are documenting that. And Bob recently returned from Pakistan working with police there, which he's going to speak uh, to us about. 
We also have Dr. Corrine Hanlon. Uh, Corrine is the Senior Defense Fellow here at USIP. She leads projects on Tunisia, North African security sector, or security and justice sector reform. She's also designing curriculum uh, for the Center for Excellence for Countering Violent Extremism in Abu Dhabi, and is working on a major project to do nothing less than design a blueprint for security sector reform for the 21st century. And Corrine came to USIP as the inaugural defense, National Defense University Fellow. So thank you. And as uh, Kathleen mentioned, we also have the two authors of the Women's Guide to Security Sector Reform right here on the stage with us. My wonderful colleague, Dr. Toby Whitman. Toby leads all the research uh, initiatives that we do at the Institute for Inclusive Security, which includes overseeing the undertaking of the research that we do and also constantly mapping the field and guiding us uh, to identify gaps and resources and needs in the field of women, peace, and security overall. Through the Institute, Toby's led training and support for coalitions of women in uh, Liberia and Uganda and was previously with USAID at the Department or the Office of Military Affairs. And she's re also researched and written extensively on topics of women and security sector inclusion. And last but not least, we have Megan Bastic from DCAF. Uh, Megan is Gender and Security Fellow with DCAF and for almost eight years has been developing research and policy guidance about integrating gender perspectives into security sector reform. Uh, Megan has, was one of the authors of the uh, Gender and Security Sector Reform Toolkit, which if you don't have a copy of, you must go out and get one, order one, harass this woman for one immediately. Uh, this uh, toolkit is really like the, the holy book of this field, uh, and we have here with us uh, one of the authors of it. So um, very excited about that. And she's also done a number of other publications, including the Gender Self-Assessment for Police Armed Forces and the Security Sector, which is a great new guide that uh, DCAF has produced to work with national actors to take them through a self-assessment process to identify gaps and opportunities for themselves to strengthen the inclusion of gender. So we are delighted to have you all with us today, so thank you. And I wanted to, I think, start with you, Megan, and ask you, uh, since you've been talking about this for so long and framing it so appropriately, why don't you kick us off uh, with a focus on strengthening security sector reform? How do women play a role? What's, how does security sector reform strengthen through women's inclusion? Jackie, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. So firstly, maybe I could just set out two of the key reasons why women really strengthen SSR. Firstly, women have a different perspective on security than men because women have different roles, they have different experiences in society, they know different things about security and they have different perceptions of what community security needs are. So a really perhaps simple example from West Africa the ICRC did um, a range of different research activities around small arms in West Africa. And they found that when men had guns, they felt more secure. But when women had guns in the house, they felt less secure. And so if you design a small arms program only talking to the men, you're going to end up with a result that doesn't meet the needs of the women. So women have, um, in many contexts, we've seen that women have insights into the, the drivers of insecurity. They know things about why groups aren't reconciling, why people are taking up arms, um, where there's corruption, and bringing that knowledge into SSR can be really helpful. And then at the same time, women have a lot of knowledge about the community security needs in the sort of broad human security sense. Women know um, what the problems are in terms of getting people into employment, accessing education, accessing healthcare, this much broader understanding of security and I think one of the things we've learned about SSR is that if it's going to be effective and well-directed, it needs to be grounded in an understanding of what the community's real security needs are. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things we like to say is that women speak not just for women in a community. They don't only know about what women need. Women know what the whole community needs and they speak with a different type of voice. And then secondly, I think it's really important to remember that women themselves are providers of security. Mm -hmm. As you say, women aren't just victims. Women play um, really important roles in communities, often in conflict resolution processes, um, in providing frontline services for victims of violence. We've seen some examples of women being involved in SSR programming, so for example, in BDR programs, in um, small arms programs. So SSR processes can try to 
um, really sort of rein in women's talent and see women as partners in SSR, as stakeholders in society that can help make an SSR program successful. Thank you. So Toby, this seems obvious and logical. Why isn't it happening more often? What are the obstacles that we're seeing? Well, I think at a, at a high level, security is considered to be a hard issue that's supposed to be dealt with, dealt with by experts in secret. Um, and most of the time, those experts are usually men uh, for, for a multitude of reasons. So I think that, that, um, that aura of secrecy um, in particular can be a challenging barrier um, for civil society to penetrate when you know, they don't know where to go. They don't even know the information that they're necessary, necessarily looking for, let alone where to find it. So I think um, that's, con that's a, a bit of uh, context. I think um, particularly for international and nationally um, led security sector reform formal processes, um, there's a focus on uh, foreign threats and less attention on um, community security. And we know that that's where civil society in particular um, has, a, has a niche, um, has a, a comparative advantage in their um, knowledge of, of local conditions. Um, I, think, uh, I think there's just also a general lack of understanding of the value of inclusion. I think that um, is to be said for our security sector and I think kind of broadly in peace and security issues. And uh, I recently read an article, I think it came out in the fall, uh, called Anchoring the Peace. Uh, anybody who's interested in a great read um, where somebody finally um, discovered the link that when uh, you look at peace negotiations, and this Norwegian researcher looked at over 80 of them, um, where there was civil society involvement in the negotiation, there was more durable um, uh, peace outcome. There was a more durable uh, settlement. And SSR is different than, um, than a peace negotiation, but I think uh, there is a perception that if we add too many voices, it, we're going to get, uh, and it's going to be, it's going to be complicated. We're going to get off topic. It's going to get messy. And it's not to say it isn't going to get messy. <laughs> it, we're certainly not here to say today that it's easy. But I think for those who are interested in, um, you know, a longer term, uh, longer term stability, I think that makes a, a powerful argument that um, that more voices get in there. Um, I think also there are cultural issues uh, between uh, women CSOs and and. Uh, security sector institutions. They speak different languages oftentimes, um, and I think that that can create a culture of mistrust, uh, which is why we've written a guide to try to overcome a bit of that. Thank you. So Bob, you've seen a lot of security sector reform processes. Can you speak a little bit to some of the advantages to uh, inclusion in the cases that you've seen? What are some of the benefits to the security actors, to the communities, et cetera? You know, it's very important to have civil women in civil society working in security forces, but it's also extremely important to have women in the security forces. Um, just as a general statement, um, for the past 20 years, I've been associated with United Nations policing, and 15 to 20 years ago, the issue was, should we have women in United Nations policing, and do we really need them? I was at a conference in Berlin recently uh, on the issue of UN policing, and the issue now has, in one sense, it hasn't changed at all. 15 years ago, there were almost no women in United Nations policing. Today, the number is, is very small, it's seven or eight percent. But the issue now has changed from why do we need women to why can't we get more women? And so the focus now is on recruiting and trying to draw women into the mm -hmm. security sector. But there's a, you know, there's a whole range of focus and functions that women can perform in security that only women can perform. And you know, we can talk more about those those later on, but just to give you a, an example, recently we've been working, uh, actually for the last two years, we've been working with the Pakistan National Police, looking at the various roles that police play in countering terrorism in Pakistan. And um, I was in, in Lahore and in Islamabad um, a couple of months ago, and I was introduced to two uh, women police officers, and I think that sort of indicative of the role that women can play one of them uh, came to the meeting in uniform. Uh, she very proudly showed me a certificate she'd received from Ban Ki-moon in New York. She had been named uh, United Nations Peacekeeper of the Year. Uh, the other woman appeared in civilian dress, and she was very proudly introduced by her male boss as a very effective undercover police agent in combating terrorism in Punjab. And then she explained, um, 
you know, the sort of hair raising missions that she's been on as a woman, being able to move into communities without attracting attention and through conversations with residents, with other women, being able to identify terrorists who, who had infiltrated into these communities. Um, and so you had two women playing very different roles, um, one in uniform, very public role, the other in a very private role, uh, but both making an amazing contribution. And did they talk at all about the difference that it makes to have women in security forces in terms of reaching and working with civilian populations, so men and women who want to engage with forces? Yes, in Pakistan, though, it's a little bit more nuanced than this. We had a delegation of about eight um, women Pakistan police officers here at USIP. This was the first female delegation of Pakistan officers that had been allowed to visit and tour the United States. So this was something of a breakthrough group. I think from that you get a sense of where things are for women in policing in Pakistan. Um, but these women made a point, and I think sometimes it's necessary for us to compromise our own ideals and our own values a little bit to, to make progress, but they said that in several major Pakistan cities there are now female-only police stations, which to us wouldn't be acceptable. But they made the point that in Pakistani society, particularly in rural areas and traditional regions, you know, it's women don't approach police officers and they certainly don't go to police stations. That you know, would be a scandal and it would also be a risk given the nature of what happens in Pakistan police stations sometimes. You know. And so they had been involved in, in police stations that had been set up with exclusively women officers and their clientele was exclusively women. But in that context, women then felt safe to be able to approach the police to um, you know, present their complaints, make their cases. And you know, in, in a situation like Pakistan, inevitably most of those cases in, involve some kind of domestic violence. You know, and so creating an environment where women could go talk to other women you know, was a big step forward. Mm -hmm. Not ideal, but they also made another point which was interesting. They said in stations, in normal police stations, where we serve with men, they said, um, we often end up being assigned clerical roles or making a copy or tea or whatever. You know, but in a station with only women officers, we do everything. We do investigations, we do interrogations, we do everything. You know, and so that's very good training um, because when, then when we go out and work with our male counterparts, you know, we have experience, we've done these things before. Mm -hmm. so interesting approach. Rangina, could you pick up on that a little bit and speak <coughs> to some of the different security concerns that women tend to raise um, separate from men? Sure. I really appreciate uh, the comment that, you know, separation um, of, of the gender or the, the different environments is not necessarily a bad step. You know, sitting in Washington, we look at it and we see it as a backward um, activity, but when you're on the ground in an environment where patriarchy is so you know, so active, the social norms of the pressure on women to act a certain way or, or deliver a certain, um, you know, certain manners in a society, the expectations for women are so great that there's, it's, it's close to impossible to have them compete on the same plane with their men counterparts. So I'm a big supporter of allowing women the opportunity to serve their communities on their own first, I mean, build or elevate their own capacity first, and then once they have that capacity, then they can, you know, jump in and, and compete with their menfolk. Of course, a lot of people are impatient and they don't want to wait for that, but that's a problem of uh, people who are making policies all over the world. But um, I guess a general thing of my experience that I've seen in Afghanistan is that you know, the, the, the simple difference uh, that I've seen between men and women and how they see the security sector is that men are constantly fighting for power. So when we're talking about security, it's about the seat. It's about the position that one is fighting for or a group is fighting for. Whereas for women, it's about the service. It's what she or her community will receive. And oftentimes, you know, I hate putting women as these token figures of, oh, all women are mothers, therefore they care for their children. But in societies like Afghanistan, nine out of the, you know, 99.9% .9 of the women are mothers and they are you know, taking care and looking after their children. So when you involve women in conversations, they're constantly talking about schools, clinics, roads that will help 
bring a better and a brighter future for their children growing up and, and for themselves. Whereas men are constantly fighting over that power seat and it seems that they're you know, killing each other for generations now over that seat and never seem to, final, to have a final agreement over that seat. So I think keeping that in mind um, and in that general overview uh, that women are important because they look after the needs of not only themselves but the needs of the society that they're serving. So Karine, are there enough examples to back up the things that we're talking about today from a policy making perspective? Is there enough evidence? Are there enough case studies to reinforce that? I think so. Um, the case that I'm um, most familiar with recently is the work that I've been doing in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And um, Bob and I and a, a colleague, Dan Brumberg, were in Tunisia and we did an assessment of the security sector um, right about at the one year anniversary of the collapse of the Ben Ali regime. And then this past January, around the time of the second year anniversary, I was back in Tunisia um, with a group doing an assessment of the security sector and we spent two weeks. Um, and we had an amazing uh, degree of access and um, were able to talk to very senior officials in the Ministry of Interior something that just hadn't been possible a year ago, even six months before mm -hmm. that. And um, we found some remarkable things. Um, what we realized when we went the first time was that there was a great deal of, of, of almost euphoria with the, the collapse of the regime and the opening of opportunities, the ability to just have conversations about what it is that the security service should do, what role should it play in society. Should it provide a service to the population, something that certainly the Tunisian security service had not. Its sole purpose of existence was to protect the Ben Ali regime. And this idea of actually meeting the needs of the population or providing a service to the population is a new concept. And so one of the big challenges in Tunisia is reorienting the entire security apparatus, and that's what it is, into something that actually serves the population. And what we found um, in our first visit, and what really struck me in the second visit, because we had a number of roundtables with civil society organizations, is first of all, the explosion of civil society organizations in Tunisia. Um, there were five official civil society organizations recognized by the Ben Ali regime. Mm. Um, in, the the whole, one in the whole country. Uh, in the entire country. Um, in the one year point, there were 2,000. I don't know what the number is today. Um, and what we found is that women play a very large, very active, very vocal role in these organizations. Many of them are led by women or co-led by women. Um, we attended a number of conferences in which there were many women speakers talking about the hard security issues. Um, and so certainly in the urban places like Tunis, you do see um, women involved in the, uh, in the security sector. I think that one of the opportunities in Tunisia is to try and bring these security organizations, these, these civil society organizations together. Mm. Those that have been there for a while have experience, they, have, um, they have, have worked the system, they know the system well, they have their connections. The newer organizations are, um, are many of them are struggling, which is why I think that this guide that you've put out is so important, not just for women-led organizations, but for brand new um, civil society organizations, because much of what you recommend in there would make a great deal of sense in a place like Tunisia. Um, and I think that trying to bridge and bring some of these newer groups together to would amplify their voice and might give them better access. They are talking about the issues and um, they are generating a great deal of debate in Tunisian society, which is an enormous change and a, and a real accomplishment. Where they are not doing as much is actually getting um, conversations within the Ministry of Interior that actually produce some kind of change. And that is, again, mm -hmm. the big stumbling block. What is remarkable in Tunisia two years after is the, the debate and the openness and the discussion of these issues. What is also remarkable is the complete lack of change in the security sector itself, certainly in the Ministry of Interior. The Ben Ali apparatus that existed at the time of um, the regime's collapse is largely intact. Hmm. Although there are bright spots and there are a few organizations that are working there, um, and notably among those is DCAP, which has done amazing work in the MOI. But beyond that, um, there just isn't real, tangible, concrete change. So I agree with you completely about the value of the guide being broader than just for women, so thanks for raising that. And that leads me to ask you, Megan, why this title? Why a women's guide if everything that we're talking about is a guide? The, saying that the content is useful for civil society, for policy shapers, for uniform personnel, et cetera. Yeah. Why go there? That is a good question. Um, and we Thank do, <laughs> <laughs> we did write the guide um, hoping that it would be read also by men. And we do feel that it speaks 
you know, we hope it speaks to a lot of civil society organisations. But we felt that there was a real need for something that was particularly addressed to women and that would encourage and inspire women to get involved and to see that their role, you know, that they have an essential role to play in SSR processes. And I think what we've, we've seen working in this area is a lot of the civil society organisations, the security think tanks, um, even the human rights monitoring organisations that have traditionally been on the fringes of SSR tend to be quite quite often male-led and more staffed by men, and women's organisations who perhaps are, you know, involved in things like domestic violence response and are working one step away from the security sector are not themselves stepping forward to engage in SSR. So really the objective of the guide was to, to, to as I say, try and encourage them and see that they have a real place. And why do you think they're not stepping forward? I think... Um, sometimes women's organisations themselves have um, a, a constrained view perhaps of their own role. Um, they see themselves as belonging very firmly in civil society and have a measure of suspicion and distrust about engaging with the security sector. Mm -hmm. And then I think sometimes they, they, don't, they don't have the language, they, they don't know how to start making the connections. So in many societies, um, men will be much more easily able to informally access security sector actors, people who hold positions of power and influence in the security sector. For example, some of the, um, we've been involved somewhat in some work that WILF, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, has been doing with women's civil society organisations in the MENA region. And one of the things that the Tunisian women that they've been talking to say is that a lot of decisions related to the reform of the security sector are made in the coffee houses, places where women literally can't go. And so it's very hard for women to access the informal networks where um, important decisions about things like security and obviously a whole range of issues in society are being made. So I think it was, we felt that there was value in really proposing concrete strategies that women could use both to access those existing sort of power and decision-making structures and also to come up with innovative ways that they could assert influence in, in different ways from um, the paths traditionally trod. So Toby, what niche do you think the, the Women's Guide fills in supporting some of the aims that uh, we just met Megan just mentioned? Well, I think what makes the guide uh, unique is that uh, it's so action-oriented and that it's so practical and so accessible. It is really geared to, as Corinne said, um, you know, getting getting women into the right ministries and making sure that those ministries change um, the decisions that they're that they're making. Um, so what we wanted to do in, in scanning um, some of the resources that were out there. Um, there's a lot of information about the security sector. Uh, it's very technical. It's filled with jargon. Um, and it's just not accessible, particularly to organizations that are starting out um, or um, peace builders or activists who are um, new specifically uh, to, uh, who are, who've worked in peace and security issues but perhaps aren't as versed in the security sector. So our goal was to make this user-friendly um, and we had uh, many, many revisions, um, many eyes uh, looking at it, uh, uh, asking, is this, you know, is this straightforward enough? Uh, we also uh, are proud that we had a, a fabulous uh, committee, uh, an advisory council of women from civil society um, from six different countries to, prov to get their um, feedback. Um, is this the right thing? You know, is this the right tone? Is this the right way to frame it? Um, so that we could make sure that it was resonating um, in a variety of contexts and that um, it was uh, gonna, gonna appeal to the people that we wanted it to appeal to. Because there just really isn't anything out there uh, that is geared towards uh, women in civil society that's action-oriented. Um, the guide lays out, you know, big picture concepts, you know, defines security, security sector reform, talks about the value of inclusion. Um, but what I think makes it really stand out is um, the focus on action. So we talk about the concepts, but then we lay out, well, how do you create change? Um, how do you research security issues? Where would you go? Um, what would be some of the first steps that you would take? Um, how do you find other people uh, to, to work with you? You know, one voice, uh, speak more loudly with many voices. So how do you find other like-minded um, women um, individuals or women CSOs? Um, how do you plan strategically? How do you engage? 
And then my favorite part of the guide uh, is a, a section uh, that's just tools. So again, focus on how do we make this as accessible um, and user-friendly as possible. And we provide a lot of the materials, not to say we're doing the work for them, but we're, we're certainly trying to make it as easy as possible. So um, you're unsure about how to light, uh, you know, write a letter to your uh, local parliamentarian who's on the oversight committee, um, well, here's a sample letter. Uh, you're unsure about a security term. Somebody said train and equip in a meeting, and you're not exactly sure what that, um, what that means. Maybe it's seen some people in the audience. We have a, secu we have a glossary of terms, um, very, very practical. Um, information, um, mapping security concepts, uh, talking points, a variety of things um, to make sure that uh, women have all the tools that they need to, to be part of the conversation. Thank you. So Rangina, we're glad you're here for many, many reasons, uh, including the fact that I think one of the biggest areas of pushback that we get uh, is people saying this is all well and good, but in a place like <laughs> Afghanistan, it's just not practical. So can you tell us how you've made that to be untrue, first of all, and some of the things that you've done so that people can understand that in a place like Afghanistan, this is as relevant, if not more relevant, uh, than anywhere else. Well, yeah, it's the best excuse that men like to use, that women are not capable. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, um, you know, that, that time is long gone. I think there are plenty of women all over the world, loud and clear, who are trying to make that assumption wrong, or prove that assumption wrong. Um, in my own experience, in a place like Kandahar, where not only the international community present and active in Afghanistan are afraid of, but even our own Afghan citizens living throughout Afghanistan are afraid of the name Kandahar. So whenever you talk about Kandahar as a province, people from Kabul or Mazar or Ghazni, you know, their eyes will be widened and say, oh, Kandahar. So it is really, indeed, that scary of a place, uh, unfortunately. But in Kandahar, uh, some years ago, when the Canadian uh, military was still present, the PRT, um, the provincial, reconstruction, the provincial team. reconstruction team, you know, I was a civil society organization's officer, and so being an active woman in the city, we obviously made contacts uh, through a variety of issues. And then finally, there, you know, through our conversations, the women, the women officers wanted to connect with women from the city, but you know, they, they didn't know the mechanism of how, how, how they were going to do that. And I guess they had approached the officials, the government, governor or the mayor or you know, other officers, and of course the men always say, oh, it's impossible for the women to meet with you guys because it's culturally unacceptable, it's, it's unsafe. And so when she asked me, when they asked me whether they could meet with ordinary Afghan women, I said, I don't want to promise you, but let me talk to the Afghan women and see if there's an interest in meeting with you. And when I talked, the women overwhelmingly said, yes, of course. Um, you know, how, we don't want them coming to our facility, but we're happy to go to the military compound. So all it took was for me to organize just the transport system to take the women from where they were in the city to the compound at the provincial reconstruction team. And that um, um, you know, that ability to take the women to them allowed us to have over 12 focus groups with different types of women. So there were the teachers group, there was the young women's group, there was the, um, you know, p women working in the medicine field, women from a home, like ordinary housewives. And that conversation led to a report that you know about, actually, um, that the military published. Now, I don't know if they've made it public or not, but... Um, which actually was the, the, the door to saying that it is possible to talk to women, it is possible to get opinions and information from women, because the military present in Afghanistan was under the assumption that you can't talk to women, women don't know anything, but that's not true. And what I want to add is that women in Afghanistan, from my experience, are a lot more expressive, and I think you've made it, um, you know, that point that women speak about things that men don't. You know, in a, in a society where men and women are so sex segregated, I mean, they're in totally different worlds of each other, because men are always in the public sphere, they have a very, um, uh, you know, a very high tendency of watching, of, you know, watching every word that comes out of their mouth because they're public figures or, you know, they're in a public scene and the repercussions of whatever they may say is a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. So men tend to not be honest or not be expressive about the realities of what is in that community and that society. Women, on the other hand, because they're at home, you know, 
they're not public figures necessarily. Nobody really knows them. And plus, if they're just women, they have a lot more things to share, and they will share it because they're not, they don't have the same fear that the men do. You know, they're, they're not necessarily going to become targets. And, you know, people talk about the burqa. Some of the women who were going to these um, meetings uh, with the P PRTs, they actually came in burqa. A few of them refused to take the burqa off because they didn't want to be identified. But under the burqa, they expressed their opinions. So sometimes, you know, these are tools that we could use to get the information that needs to be out um, and not necessarily see the repercussions behind, you know, afterwards. Um, so it is possible to have, uh, you know, women do this, and we've done it. And I also see women in Afghanistan, and this is a great example in Kandahar, but women in Kabul and elsewhere have been, uh, you know, voluntarily serving as monitors and oversight figures for policies and, and things, I mean, programs that are active on the ground. So whoever says that women are not capable of or unable to get involved, um, they need to do a little bit more homework. <laughs> so in those groups, what were some of the benefits that the women accrued and what were some of the benefits the NATO forces accrued? What, what was in it for each of them? For the Afghan women, um, it was an eye-opening experience in the sense that it erased the myth that exists from the insurgent, um, insurgent groups where, uh, and it's very unfortunate, but they say that you know, there's a military base um, and obviously it's all international troops there. So any woman ever physically going to that base is going for sexual favors because that's the only definition and in a culture where women's identity is so you know, uh, protected and, uh, you know, saved. The whole uh, baggage of honor lies on the shoulders of women. The men and the women try to do everything in their power to protect themselves from getting that, that bad name. Um, so that, when the women went and they saw that there are actually other women, they were surprised that there were women military personnel from the international community. They, they could never assume that there were women there. Um, they saw that the women were interested in their, their own families' issues, the issues of their children, of whether there were schools in the community, whether there were paved roads for them to come from villages to the city. That was an eye-opening experience for the Afghan women to know that they're actually people who care about our needs rather than you know, coming here to kill us and bomb us because that, that's the propaganda that the insurgents use. For the military women, um, obviously, for them it was an eye-opening experience in that it was the first time that they saw somebody publicly talking, public as public it can be, it was a small focus group, but you know, directly talking about certain leaders in the community and the things that they were doing wrong. So for, I mean, it was almost like a monitoring mechanism uh, indirectly saying, well, we, we have our trust and faith in the village elder, for example, in a specific village. But these women were saying, well, he or his men has done this, this, and that. And so they were you know, very frantically taking notes down to say, well, we, we, we've never heard this before. So again, it goes back to women being expressive and not being afraid of what the honest truth is, and they will share. Of course, it requires you to double check to make sure what they're saying is correct or not. But um, they did not know that women could actually uh, put in words the needs, the concerns, and the issues that were so important to know about specific leaders in the community and or government, government officers, uh, such as a governor or mayor or other officials. I find this fascinating, and I think, Kareen, you might want to, um, I'm sure this resonates with you as well, but the link to uh, looking at ways that women moderate extremism in communities, and you were talking, Rangina, about uh, the narratives that are being put forward by the insurgents about what international forces are here to do, et cetera, and thinking of women as a force encountering that narrative and recognizing mm -hmm. the influence that women have both in the private sphere in their homes and in the public sphere about saying, no, this is actually what we're doing here, and, and some of the some of what they're doing is actually um, in, to our benefit. And I'm wondering, Karine, if you could pick up on that a little bit and talk a bit about the role of women in moderating extremism. I think the, the narrative of extremism or that, that the specter of growing extremism in Tunisia is a real problem. And it's a problem that has emerged recently. Um, and I, when our meetings with the various police institutions, the police, the National Guard, um, the military, intelligence, judicial police, I mean, you run the whole gamut of the police apparatus, their biggest challenge is how to deal with 
extreme, how to identify it, and how to appropriately deal with it. And this is a major challenge if you can think of a police institution that doesn't have appropriate relationships with the population for day-to-day -day interactions. Can you go to your police station and report a crime, for example? Can you, as a woman, go to the police station and report um, a crime in the home? Um, and then elevate that to actually being able to, to counter this new threat of violent extremists, some of whom now in Tunisia are actually armed. This is another byproduct of the transition. Mm -hmm. Prior to ben Ali's, the Ben Ali regime collapse, mm -hmm. police um, would say that the biggest threat they faced in interacting with populations was fists. Mm -hmm. Well, now they run into civilians who are armed, and they're finding um, groups of arms, and they're finding uh, extremists that are training and are able to transit borders. So it's a real problem, and it's growing, and it worries them tremendously. I think that um, for civil society, it would be um, I, the, the one problem that, it, that I think applies to extremism to all other aspects is that there is a, a tremendous amount of distrust between the police and civil society. They don't yet understand that, in fact, they could work um, in partnership to address some of these issues. Many of these police officers, and they've hired a whole number of police officers in the last year, and so the incidents that if you've read about um, some of the abuses of the police recently, for example, the woman that was, um, that was raped while um, her boyfriend was robbed by police officers. Um, these were new recruits who had gone through an expedited six-week training because when the regime collapsed, many police officers fled. And so they had big gaps in providing um, basic services, so they hired a number of new police officers that hadn't gone through appropriate training. They've added a human rights segment to the police training curriculum. It's eight hours. Um, and so there's a need for more of that. Um, but the biggest issue is this, is this dialogue. How can the police explain to populations what it's doing to make change? Because these reforms are not going to happen overnight. But if they had a way of conveying, we've got a plan, we're beginning to implement it, we have a two or three or five year plan, or these are the kinds of steps that we're beginning to take, or can you tell us some of the concerns and things that the police should address? If there was that kind of a dialogue, which doesn't exist now, if there is a dialogue, it's a shouting dialogue. Um, it's not a listening one, uh, would be of tremendous benefit. And I think in terms of, of the extremist challenge, um, one approach that we're exploring is this community policing model, that your population is a resource to track and identify potential threats before they emerge into real ones. And that requires a great deal of trust between police organizations and the community. Mm -hmm. And I think civil society organizations, and particularly women-led organizations, um, uh, could play a very important role. Uh, and, and of course, you know, in violent extremism, it's the softer side, the softer tools, so education, engaging local actors, all of these kinds of things beyond just the police training curricula are important areas where civil society organizations could play an important role. So is it on the radar when you go on these trips and you're uh, interacting with other internationals and national actors mm -hmm. who are focused on this reform, are they talking about women's civil society groups? Are they talking about women in communities? Where, where does it fit in the, in the policy discourse right now? Um, the subject of women and women's rights in Tunisia is a big topic because um, the fear uh, among Tunisian women, and particularly in urban centers where you're going to see the most of this, is that the transition to democratic rule is going to lead to the erosion of rights of women in Tunisia. Because Tunisia is, is, is an unusual case in the region in that women had, um, relative to women in other countries in that region, a great deal more access. You saw women in, um, and see women in all of the professions. And it was particularly striking, I think, in the legal, legal profession and among the magistrates. And the key magistrate organizations are all run by women, very accomplished women magistrates who are pushing transitional justice and independent judiciary, um, very actively involved. But the big concern is that those that access and those rights and their ability to pursue careers like this will be eroded by the transition. And so what's happening with women's rights is very much tied into this battle, really, in Tunisia for the identity of what the new Tunisia is going to look like. Is it an Islamist state? Is it a secular state? Is it some Tunisian combination of the two? If so, how is that defined? The battles over how we define women as complementary to men, if you read that about the, in the early drafts of the Constitution, 
um, as proposed language, that would be a, a, a significant reduction in the rights of women. So these are all tied in together, and, and certainly the security sector and the role of civil society organizations was part of it. But it really is about the role of women in the new Tunisia and how that's going to be enshrined in the Constitution, um, in, 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 in edu education policy, and admission to, um, to careers in, in medicine or, or in the legal profession, for example. And obviously drawing out how important it is for women to be involved in this transition yes. or this reform phase as opposed to you know, being silent or absent in this mm -hmm. such that that is defined for them effectively. Yeah. Bob, you've seen some great examples of community policing and some new models in Pakistan. Can you talk a little bit about those? Okay. Um, one thing that, that we discovered about the Pakistani police is that Amazingly, in this huge organization, hundreds of thousands of police officers who have a very negative um, public image in Pakistan, is a cadre of men who are in the senior ranks of the police in the police service of Pakistan who come into the police through the civil service exam. And this is a group, particularly the younger officers, who have lots of international experience. Most of them have been in the United Nations police missions. Many of them have, um, are graduates of Western universities. And what they've tried to do is to bring these experiences back to, to Pakistan and to focus in on police community relations. And uh, one of the things that they promoted is, of course, increasing the role of women in policing, but also they've worked on increasing the role of civil society in policing. Um, police everywhere have as one of their basic jobs resolving disputes. You know, if there's an argument and the police officer comes along, he tries to sort it out and get the people to shake and you know, go away happy. In Pakistan, this is a major task for police, where sort of contrary to their public image, police get involved in resolving all kinds of disputes, even disputes involving lots of money or dis disputes involving revenge killings. These officers, for example, have brought in the community to take over this responsibility of, of mediating disputes and doing, doing this kind of work. Also, they brought in the community to do things like handling security for festivals and, and public events, where instead of having the police officer out there you know, enforcing order, you have a community group men that's and out women. there. Men and women enforcing order. Um, so you know you have, and also bringing the community men and women to oversee the work of the police. So you have a, a sort of community review process where um, police have access, or women, men have access to the police station. They have access to police records. They're able to look and see how the police responded to complaints, mm -hmm. and they're able to make this known to the police leadership, to politicians. So you know, there's a whole range of things um, that. Um, and then there's the usual things that police do with, with sporting events and public affairs and, and police going out and speaking to the community. These are all things that we accept as, as a part of police work in the United States. But in a place like Pakistan, these are, these are innovative. Um, before I relinquish the floor, I wanna, go, I wanna go back to the guide for a second. I think it's very important to focus on women, but it's also important to focus on men and I think the guide is very useful for men. It's a place where, where I can pick up something and very quickly read through and find out what I need to know. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, Daniel Del Torres, who's also from DCAF. Daniel and I are old friends. He's a former Spanish police officer. He's been doing this work for a long period of time. Um, one of the things that happens, I find, in these kinds of gatherings, speaking as a man, is that you have these wonderful discussions, and they're mostly between women. Mm -hmm. And Kathleen and I have talked about the fact that if we, and we've experimented with this, if you put gender in the title of an event, you get one kind of an audience. If you run the same kind of event but take the word gender out, you get a totally different kind of an audience. Mm -hmm. And so I think, as you said, in societies where you have um, entrenched patriarchy, and in societies where men really still control things, the most meaningful pitch may be not to women, but to men. The woman that I described, the undercover Pakistan police officer who was introduced proudly by her boss, would never have gotten that opportunity unless the man who was her superior, who's now been named the home minister in Punjab, you know, obviously a very distinguished fellow who's, who's uh, you know, very well respected, 
but he gave her this opportunity. And then she was able to prove that she could do the work. And so um, I think we need to think as a group about how we make these um, May make this message available to men, and maybe you know when you write your next book or something, <laughs> change the title a little bit. So we call it the Men's Guide to <laughs> or something. Do you want to comment on that at all? Because we certainly did have these discussions; they were very live for us for a very long time, and we couldn't agree with you more. Also, Danny came. Danny, uh, we've all shared a little bit of Danny. I think Danny worked at Inclusive Security before joining DCAF uh, and is, is a great voice in our ear for that. Um, but we did land on that for a specific reason. I don't know if Toby or, or Megan, you want to you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it raises sort of questions about who you're talking about as a target audience that you want to empower and who you're talking about and they as who they're going to address mm -hmm. in that very much in our thinking, we're not assuming that women in civil society only speak to women in positions of power. Although, you know, there are interesting questions about to what extent women can build on their sort of relationship, mm -hmm. sisterhood with other women mm -hmm. and use that as an, an advocacy, advocacy strategy, if you like. Um, very often women in civil society will be talking to men as power brokers um, and then to, to what extent you can harness men as champions of, of gender equality and women's rights, I think is a really good issue to raise. Yeah, and I think, I mean, yes, the title is A Woman's Guide, but I think our approach to it um, is very much to bring men along by making this an argument about um, the positive difference that women's inclusion make and not solely a rights argument. Um, I'm going to take a bet that the Pakistani police officer inter you know, brought along um, the fabulous female officer, the male officer brought along the female officer, not because he necessarily had a strong belief in women's rights, but he probably thought she was a really good police officer. And he had specific reasons for why that was the case. And I think that that is something we've really tried to highlight in the guide of what the value of inclusion is in a very practical bottom line way that could appeal both to, um, to men and women. And I think the next evolution of the guide yeah. is exactly what you're saying. So maybe anyone in this audience might also want to pick that up with us. <laughs> yes, Go just ahead. to give you an example of how this can work sometimes. In, um, in Kosovo in 1999, when the international community moved to Kosovo, I was at the Department of Justice. The International Police Training Program there had the lead in developing the police assistance program. The United Nations set a quota for women. And this is a very traditional society, repressed by, by the, uh, the Yugoslav regime. And um, the UN said, we will have 15% of this new police force be women. And initially, we thought, this is going to be difficult. Actually, it wasn't. Women stepped forward, mostly married women. Who, who came forward from very traditional roles to join the police. Having, and a couple of weeks ago, we, we do a course here in, in capacity building for security sector reform. One of the speakers was an American police woman, the first American police woman, and she had been in Kosovo. And she had a photograph of her standing next to a female police cadet and um, in her uniform. And then she said this was, and she gave the woman's name, and now this is her picture today, and it was a picture of the president of Kosovo. Mm. And through her participation in the police service, she rose to the ranks, of course, she was exceptional, but then she's now been honored. You know? And so um, you know, this, this is also a pathway. The security services can be a pathway for women to advance and take responsibility. You know, just like any other role of society, but it's it's particularly important, I think, that we focus on this. Yeah. Bob, sticking with you for a sec, what are some of the some of the policy shifts that you think, uh, particularly with either within the UN or the U.S. government, that are most uh, essential or most needed to helping see these changes be brought about? You know, this is a real problem because I think in, start with the UN first, and going back to this conference in Berlin where we had. Um, I think you know we spent a whole afternoon uh, in a discussion led by the Swedish policewoman who is the commander of UN police forces mm -hmm. worldwide. You know, and the issue was not um, why can't we get more women to step forward. And the answer to that is if you look at national police forces, including the United States, there just are not women in policing, and so the 
the frustrating thing is I think in Western countries, certainly in the United States, but also in other countries of the world, the message is out, we need more women in policing. The problem is how do you get women to volunteer? And that's the frustration. And I, I think we've now come to a sort of point where we no longer need to worry about whether women are required. Women are required. They prove their worth. They can do things that no one else can. Now the problem is how do we promote women's participation? But it has to start you know, it, it, at the basic level so that when women, so we have women who have the experience to take these international roles. You know, and then when you look at the United States, we have the same problem. How do we, how do we get women to go into this field, which is very difficult? Um, we had a conference here on the stage last week that looked at the role of community policing um, in countering violent extremism. You know, and um, we had a couple of women police officers, but the rest of the speakers were all men. And this was from people who came from all over the world to speak. So it's a, it's, that's the challenge. And I'm not sure I have an answer for how you do this, but it's, it should be a focus now. You know, because I think that the door is open. We just need to create opportunities and impetus for women to come through that door. Rangina, in Afghanistan. Uh, from your perspective, in that sense, what are some of the things that international actors can be doing to encourage women in civil society in particular to engage with security forces? <clears throat> well, there's um, a couple of things on the ground uh, that's already happening that needs to be um, not only accepted but applauded um, in this time of su such insecurity on the ground in Af all over Afghanistan. Really, we're, we're still not sure what 2014 will really bring to us or, or leave us with. Um, it's important to note that women's organizations such as um, AWN, the Afghan Women's Network, which is, you know, works closely with uh, inclusive security, you know, they've, they've made a, a, recently, they're working on finishing a position paper on the impact of transition on women's security. And this is work that Afghan women in Afghanistan have uh, put together, you know, they've researched and talked to other women to get their opinion. And these are the types of papers or information that one should be looking at to really get what are Afghan women saying about uh, this whole transition process. Um, another suggestion um, that is, uh, you know, in the works is that, you know, it's it's good to suggest and, and talk about what needs to be done, but it, it's really, at the end of the day, it's about action. You know, it's about, it's about funding. Um, there's, I, I don't know the whole budget about uh, how much money really the U.S. gives to the Afghan security forces, but I'm assuming that it's, I've, I've heard it's around $10 billion a year. There's a proposal um, asking for $15 million of that to be allocated to women's training, um, you know, um, recruitment of women into the security sector now that we know that women are necessary. Well, how are you going to make it happen? You're only going to make it happen by giving it the proper funds to make it happen. Um, so that's a very practical and a very real um, you know, action item that can be implemented. Of course, the hesitation is, oh, $15 million uh, seems a lot for a women's project, but compare that to $10 billion for and men. And it's not a women's project. And it's, it's not a, a women's project. project. It's a security right. project. It's for the whole country. Um, and you know, it will address. It, it broke my heart. I was in Kandahar last month, actually, and one of the women who used to work with us in the embroidery center, she's, she has a husband, but her husband is lazy and doesn't want to work, so she's forced herself to provide for her seven children. She could not make her ends meet with our salary, so she went and found a security job at a local, uh, it's, it's a government office. I, I don't remember exactly which office. Um, so she would serve as the security guard, as an entry person. Uh, she doesn't get any training, so she's just asked, you're a woman, you go in, and as women are coming and entering this office facility, you do the check. So she just taught herself that you check them because she's been to other events where she's seen women do the check. There's no facility for her to go and use the toilet. There are no female toilets in this facility. And this is really sad. People laugh at it, but it broke my heart when she came to my office crying because she quit her job, saying that she wanted to go to the bathroom. There was no bathroom for her. So there was this tea kettle in the facility that she was sitting in. She had to. She didn't want to go in her clothes. She used that tea kettle for her bathroom. 
and then stole that tea kettle out of the facility and then threw it out because she didn't want somebody else making tea in that tea kettle after she'd used it for her bathroom. I mean, these are the realities on the ground. We talk about $10 billion, and then we have a hard time committing a small amount to provide basic needed facilities for women to do their job. Um, and I, I believe that if we allow and equip and train the women to, you know, to do the security jobs that they're required to do, I think Afghanistan will definitely have a better and a brighter future than the current one that we have. There's some interesting things that are going on in terms of recruiting women into the, into the Afghan police, of which there, there are a very small percentage now, but there's, a, there's an effort. One of the things, we were talking earlier about how we have to sort of adjust our values, but one of the things that has been done is where women are recruited and going through training, the training ends early in, early in the day so the women can go home and cook dinners for their families. There are a lot of these little adjustments, including daycare, you know, that all have to be built in. And I take your point that women are a special case and that and men don't often think about these kinds of, of, of uh, requirements for women's service, but it's something that we all need to put into our guides, you know, that there is a whole series of things other than just having the woman trained to do her particular task, but all the support services, they're very important. While we're on the subject of obstacles to overcome, does anyone else want to um, identify some very specific steps that uh, national, local actors could take? And then we're gonna open it up for questions. And I know there are, will be two microphones circulating. I think, Kathleen, is that correct? We've got two. So uh, prepare your questions, and in just a minute, we'll, uh, we'll turn to the audience. Make. <clears throat> One of these, what I always feel is the boring intervention about monitoring and evaluation. <laughs> I think what we often see, or sometimes see, is that on a high policy level, there's something about being gender sensitive. And so, you know, a number of the UN has a SSR policy framework that emphasizes the need to be responsive to gender. A number of states that support SSR processes in conflict affected countries. Um, have gender in their policy, and then in many of the countries we're talking about, there might be some sort of 1325 national action plan. But you can see that on a policy, on a policy level, there's something about being gender sensitive, maybe even something about involving and consulting women. But often when you get down to the programmatic level, it just disappears. And so there may be some well-meaning individuals that do something about trying to meet with local women, but there's nothing systematic in programming. And it, in really emphasizing this, I guess I'm speaking to those of us in the audience who often act as external support in SSR processes in some way. What are we doing to make sure that in our programming frameworks, there are indicators around consulting and involving women? How do we hold ourselves accountable? How do our, our donors hold us accountable? How do we hold them accountable? I think we need to get much better at um, translating the sort of good practice that the guide tries to capture and that we talk about on a policy level into things that we measure, both in how we allocate resources, of course, how we fund things, and how we um, evaluate and monitor the impact of the work that we're doing. I think there'll be a lot of sympathetic ears to your boring M&E <laughs> intervention in this crowd. Um, I'll just jump in with a, a, a quick comment. I think that there's uh, a focus on an international um, funding on um, supporting state institutions. Um, that's kind of the obvious you know, partner. Um, and I think that by just focusing on the state institutions, on the state security institutions, um, we miss the, the civil society um, around that. Um, I just read a uh, UN office, I think there was 72% uh, of funds um, went, uh, of donor support went to supporting specific security sector institutions and only 7% of funds went to supporting civil so softer civil society initiatives. Um, and civil society initiatives are cheap. Um, <laughs> so it's certainly considerate. Um, it, it's a lot of uh, bang for your buck. I, uh, I think one of the challenges is that in, in places that are emerging from conflict when you're looking at SSR or in the midst of, of transition and, and security is tenuous and there are a great deal of challenges, I think there's this tendency um, at, at the actual implementation level to think of some of the gender mainstreaming challenges or, or goals as being a nice thing to have when we stop people from killing each other and we stop the shooting or mm -hmm. let's, let's deal with the immediate problem and then we'll work it in a little bit later. Yeah. And so 
For example, in Tunisia right now, how do you get the police to interact better with demonstrators? How do they better manage demonstrations so that they're not shooting demonstrators? Um, and, and the problem is, if, if you delay that a little bit, then when do you bring the gender issues into it? And so in some ways, if you plan and, and focus on that, that's part of the mindset from the outset, um, thinking about having women police officers um, dealing with crowds and demonstrators, for example, from the very beginning, or focusing on that in all of the training and, and, and immediate actions that you take, there's, a, there's, I think, a greater tendency to have it part of the process mm -hmm. rather than something that gets added on yeah. later, yeah. and probably not added on as well because it's not part of the holistic plan. Yeah. I think Anya was saying the words operational effectiveness earlier, and I think that's a, a lens through which we don't talk about this. Yeah. Uh, we're going to open the floor to questions. If anyone has a question, please raise their hand, and we'll take probably two or three and then go back to, uh, to our panelists. We have one right in the front here, and here. You can just raise your hands and someone will bring you a microphone. If you could introduce yourself. Yeah, good morning, beginning. ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflict resolution and violence prevention. I come from Kenya. Uh, I thank you for the wonderful presentation on the including women into the civil society, into peacekeeping. What I wanted to comment is uh, looking at all your presentations, uh, how do you involve us as civil society? Civil society, especially in Africa, where we have conflicts on the ground, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, wherever. I was one of the election observers mm. in the Kenya election as a woman-owned organization, and we were never funded. But because I had civil society in Kenya, they had to help me to the election observation, but we focused more on violence and conflict resolution. That's what we focused on. How do we work together, as he said? You find the USA government is funding, putting millions of dollars into the other securities, and the civil society on the ground too much work more than even the military, because these are the people with the information. These are people who can tell you what is happening, peacemakers, mediators, and they can really, really do the best job than even the military fighting or other people. So how do we include and get funding for supporting the, uh, this uh, initiative of uh, women into security? Women are the best security givers in the world. With the women, there can be no more conflict. So we need to collaborate with you guys <laughs> and see how we can work on the ground and become securities from the house the communities and countries, because people who are fighting inside us are young people. We are the mothers. We know where our children are going. We have to ask them, where are you going? Because of poverty-related issues, they would go to fight somebody to get money or kill, and while you are the mother, you won't say anything. But how do we turn it into opportunities? Because we are the mothers, when they get out of the house, we know where they are going. When they come out, we need to ask, where do you go? So all this can happen when we collaborate and work together as civil society organizations, as women, because we are the best security more than the army, the military, or the police. So thank you so much. The main thing is how do we get funding? How do we get the women? Now we are here talking about this. They need to hear what we are talking about. In Africa, we need to have a video conference here. When we are talking, they are listening to what you are talking about because now we are international women into conflicts is all over the world. If violence is all over the world, we can't say in America, Afghanistan, in Africa. So it's all over, and women face the same issues. We go through the same things, conflicts, displacement, when there is war and conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take another question over here. Uh, and I just want to say, Rosemary, Congratulations on the lack of electoral violence in Kenya's election. I think the, there's a major case study just waiting to be written right now about the role of civil society in preventing that violence. And we didn't hear a great deal about the elections in Kenya because of the work that you and other women in civil society did. So I can't wait for someone to write, up, write that up and share it more broadly. Uh, yes, please. Good morning. I'm Colonel Biram Job from Senegal. And I'm the director of Partners Senegal, which is an NGO working with uh, I have worked with uh, uh, Anya uh, on uh, gender mainstreaming within the Senegalese uh, armed forces, and our main mission is to try to bridge, uh, to, to, to build the bridges between different actors and have them work on different teams. They, they, 
uh, they uh, consider as being very important. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the Institute for Inclusive Security, for quoting me in this guide. I have worked a lot. <laughs> I have worked a lot on uh, defining documents, and in my opinion, it's part of it because I believe strongly in the fact that something that is not well conceptualized will not be well practiced. But having worked on the ground, I have noticed that also we are very weak in implementing the documents. So I would like you to uh, share with us what could be your strategy for implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll take one more before we go back up. Over here, please. Right in front of us. Shelby Quask with Equality Now, but also on the Civil Society Working Group for Women, Peace, and Security in the US. And my question is, goes back to the international actors. And a lot of times, foreign policy is based on government to government. But as we know, that an acting government or an opposition party doesn't really represent, oftentimes, the citizens in the country. And really informing foreign policy by talking to civil society groups and having better access um, on behalf of, for example, the US government, of really reaching out so they can better inform their policies and understand what the challenges are and what the issues are, especially with the women's groups. Um, I think at the top we see that, but at the actual level of in-country, um, often the doors are closed and women do not have access to inform that policy. And then the other piece I was just curious about is oftentimes, I've never been to a country that's post-conflict, conflict-affected developing, or any place that does not have women who know what's going on who are aware of what the challenges are, who have ideas on how to move forward, yet so oftentimes our programming is designed elsewhere. And we come in and end up disempowering the local women's groups by putting together other civil society groups or supporting new groups. And I'm just wondering, how do you think we might be able to better inform our programming and financial support to not disempower those groups who've been existing and fighting for a long time? Thank you. Panelists. Bob, please. I'd like to pick up on the last thing you said, this, this, this business of, of how, do, how, do we, how do we deal with the sort of back steps that are occurring, particularly in North Africa, and go back to, to an experience that, um, that we had when we were in Tunisia. We met one evening around 6 o'clock. It was getting dark with... Uh, a group of people that had been human rights activists under the old regime. And, and it was a man in his 50s, probably, who had been a human rights fighter. And uh, they talked about you know, fighting Ben Ali, and now this was a new day. And uh, about 7 o'clock, he said, I've, I've got to excuse myself. I have to go, and I have to be on television. And uh, I'm debating a young woman from one of our universities and uh, she is arguing that she should be able to wear a veil during her university exams. And I am arguing against that. And I thought, that's a very strange <laughs> kind of situation. But you know, the kind of things that we are encountering and that are being encountered in, in North Africa today, where these issues of progress that had been achieved under our values are now being rolled back. And it, that's, that's a, a focus now that we have to to be aware of, that it's not just you know, marching forward in lockstep. But there are forces that present themselves as being forces of, of religion or forces of, of progress that actually want to turn, turn these things around. And I think one of the things that we lack as, a, as an international community is a really convincing narrative now. You know, we've had that at other times in our past. But we really don't have a convincing narrative of, of, about why our values are really, really more useful, important, effective than the values that we're confronting. Because the people on the other side who want to change things have a very effective narrative, and they're very good at putting that forward. You know, so um, it's just one other thing in the mix. I'd like to add, uh, the voice is working, but. Um, 
your comment reminded me of an incident in Afghanistan where um, when the security situation on the ground in, in Kandahar was at its peak, I mean, there were bomb blasts, multiple bomb blasts on a daily basis. We as women, you know, we're a small group, we, we, we wanted to share our frustration with the world or with our community, but we didn't know how to go about it. So we just kind of sat together without really planning for it, without thinking what we were going to do. We, one woman suggested their local shrine every Thursday, is devo every Thursday is dedicated to women coming to that shrine. So let's just go to that shrine where other hundreds and thousands of women will be there. And the least we could do is pray, to, pray together for peace. And before we knew it, our voices started to be, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the guy who heads the masjid or the shrine saw that we were praying as women together. He brought a mic, turned on the generator, turned the mic on, and our voices were echoed all around us. And it's an open community shrine. So the men who are all in the neighborhood or in the area all are staring, you know, behind the bars wondering what is happening. And of course, the news then went on that the women were praying for peace and security, for that they're sick and tired of war and killing, and they, they want an end to it. So it made news later. And then it got to the UN. And God bless the UN. They pick up the incident. And for March, March 8th, which is International Women's Day all over the world, they, tr they took our event and transformed it into a national event, kind of forcing groups to come together and do similar events. And it lost, you know, it lost its essence because people were forced to do something that it was not natural. And I've seen that happen many, many times with international organizations, unfortunately, who are pressured by time and budgets that need to be spent because some action has to happen and something great needs to come out of it. And of course, you break pictures. But at the end of the day, even what we did spontaneously as just women kind of, kind of got tagged along with what the UN did. And the UN, unfortunately, sometimes or a lot of times doesn't have a good image in, in some places. And so it's, it's true that we need to stop, um, what's the word you use, disempowering local women's groups because I think sometimes just allowing communities to be spontaneous, to be, you know, it, they don't need funding for every single action item on the ground. You know, let's, let's give the communities that liberty that action doesn't necessarily need funding. I agree with you that for specific planned events and activities, there needs to be that structure funding in the, in the place. But for spontaneous community events that are culturally acceptable and people are willing to volunteer their time to it, let's try not to put the funding stamp on it and, um, and, and disempower the community level at that level. I think there's an interesting point to be made, too, about your, the implementing of the larger documents and the bigger concepts. And uh, I was thinking about that as you mentioned this um, um, Abdesatar Musa, who is the head of the Tunisian mm -hmm. Human Rights League, who um, in, in November of last year, where they had the big protests in Siliana that were organized by the UGTP, the labor union, and the police knew that they had been having problems dealing with protesters. And so the National Guard that operates in Siliana decided to try and, and, and make some change. And they elected to not use regular bullets to shoot protesters, but to use birdshot. And their thinking was that birdshot would be less lethal. And so they would be less likely to kill people. Um, and so they were trying to find a way to work under the existing legal structure, which authorizes police to use force in demonstrations, to disperse demonstrations, and also authorizes them to shoot protesters as they flee demonstrations. And so the innovation was to use birdshot because they would be sending a message to disperse, but with less likelihood of, of killing the individuals. As they use the microphones to, to call people to disperse, they turn, they shoot the bird shot, and they ended up blinding a very large number of demonstrators. So here you have an example of, of the police trying to figure out within the legal confines, which have yet to be reformed. There's been no change in the police law, although they are working on it. But those, those laws have not yet been changed. They know that they're not interacting appropriately with populations. They live among the population. Uh, the police is a, is a profession that, that nobody wants to join. It's not like here where 
my father, my grandfather, my uncle, everybody in my family was a police officer. I'm a police officer. There it is if you go through the civil service exam, the very last option that you would take is a to be a police officer because it's better than being unemployed. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different kind, but that all of those different issues come together. And I think in, in some of these documents, which tend to focus on the entire security sector and all of these enormous challenges that have to take place, you focus on the microcosm of, of, of demonstrations as a problem, and it shows that you're changing institutional cultures, you're changing operating procedures, you're changing things that, that are going to take, we measure, we measure success in decades. And quite often, we end up on panels where we're asked, you know, can you give us a success of SSR in its entirety? And it's very hard to do because we, you, you really do have to look long term. There's progress in some parts, but less progress in others. And, um, I think in the case of Tunisia, but I'm sure this is true in many other places, there's so much opportunity for, for experts and organizations, and you know, DCAP has been one of the few that's done tremendous work in Tunisia in, inside the Ministry of Interior, where other groups have not had that kind of access yet, um, to, to start to advise and support. And this is true um, with civil society organizations and particularly on women's issues as well. And so I, I, I applaud this book, and I think, um, I think your comment is, is, is a very good one, because that is a struggle. There are these fantastic guides, very large guides for, for holistic security sector reform in which we work in perfect concerts with many other donors to address these issues, but then things don't move quickly enough, and so you have organizations that themselves or police officers that know they have a problem and try and make an innovation that ends up not actually solving but creating a new set, set of problems. And so um, that would be a point that I would add in terms of your question. And I know uh, Toby and Megan want to jump in, but unfortunately we have to lose Bob, not because as our only man he's being ejected from the <laughs> panel, but he had a previous commitment that he could not break. So uh, Bob's going to step off, but we really appreciate you sharing and, and, uh, and representing the variety of experiences that you've had. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Toby. I just wanted to respond to um, Colonel Diop um, in terms of strategies of implementation for the Women's Guide. Um, Sorry, and thanks, Kathleen. I think we're losing you also. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Toby. Um, we, uh, the Institute for Inclusive Security has a network of over a thousand women peace builders in uh, over 40 conflict affected areas around the world and we are beginning a series of webinars uh, exposing uh, women uh, around the world to the guide. Um, the guide is written to the individual and, we, and um, we're eager to, to connect with um, as many women as we can to expose them to it, to get them excited about it um, and uh, encourage them. To, uh, to develop a plan of action um, around it. So that is gonna be happening. Um, we uh, have been working, um, we've met with uh, um, uh, uh, Partner Senegal um, and are discussing how we can uh, work more closely, how we can expose the guide, um, how we can integrate the guide into um, program, fabulous programming that, that they're doing. Um, and I open, I um, invite you all to ask us for similar, um, similar assistance. Um, we'd be more than pleased, um, Institute for Inclusive Security as well, DCAP, to work with other um, uh, organizations who are interested um, in thinking about how they can integrate some of the teachings of the guide into programs that they're doing right now on the ground. So um, please speak with me afterwards um, if that is at all interesting to you so we can stick, take it further. Uh, we're also exploring some opportunities, again, together with DCAP um, in Libya, which we're uh, hopeful uh, would work, uh, work out with an amazing organization of Voices, uh, Voice of Libyan Women um, and some things in the Balkans that Megan actually knows a few de more details about. Right. Um, I wanted to respond a little bit to some of the comments about, um, well, Bob's comment in a sense about the strength of our narrative as external actors and one of the questions around um, the sort of the challenge of engage, engaging with civil society and who you engage with, who sets your agenda, if you like. And I think that really reinforces the importance of thinking about the value of local ownership in this engagement with civil society. We talk a lot, certainly at DCAP, we talk a lot about local ownership in security sector reform. The fact that as external agents supporting an SSR process, um, we need to be very careful that we're not setting the agenda trying to set the agenda and trying to steer too much what direction it should go in. And I think it's really important to hold that value dear when we try and support women's civil society organisations as well. What I feel that we've learned through our experience is that you need to make a much longer term commitment. You can't necessarily expect to have 
measurable outputs, unfortunately, in a one-year program cycle. You need to invest the time in um, giving people space to work out what they want to pursue as program objectives. You can't come as the, the sort of funding agent saying we think you should work on points one to six. Um, because, I mean, as you were saying, Regina, if, if people aren't interested, they, they won't be on board. And um, it's very important to, to let local civil society organisations strike out their own agendas, even if it's not necessarily um, what fits your own policy objectives as an organisation sometimes, um, and to really see it as a long-term investment in a process. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amir. Um, just I came uh, last uh, week from Egypt. I spent the uh, last six months working in women visa security between uh, UN Women New York and UN, UN Women in Cairo. Mm. Um, my question to the speaker, how we can, as a civil society, dealing with the uh, unwilling from the government, and how we can deal with the Islamist raising after the Arab Spring. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. Okay. I'm Deborah Alexander, and I've just returned from several years in Afghanistan. And I wanted to follow up a little bit on a question that comes from the Tunisia experience and also the Afghan experience. It's been our observation that civil society organizations are flourishing in Afghanistan and in Tunisia. And as well as most of the ministries in Afghanistan now, even at the provincial level, have some sort of a gender recruitment integration plan, many of those plans aren't being implemented. And so I'm wondering about, um, from your experiences, from case studies possibly in other countries, is there an opportunity for those embryonic civil society organizations to actually become the monitors of their government's gender plans or do we have examples where that's worked and how might that work? What would be some of the obstacles to that? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, someone could come up there. We should keep you running. Hi, Colin Christopher from the World Organization for Resource Development and Education. Um, we do some work uh, supporting CSOs in uh, South Asia. We recently re released a report on organizations in Pakistan countering extremism through religious and or cultural means. Um, and so my question is for Ms. Hamidi. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak about specific examples of CSOs in Afghanistan uh, that are countering violent extremism through um, uh, Islamic principles um, and how that's countering uh, some of the more cultural-based uh, patriarchal norms in society. Thanks. All right, we'll do one last question in this round and then open it up. Thank you, I'm Eleanor Cambridge. I'm from the DOD Inspector General's office. Um, you touched on this and you, you started to talk a little bit about the role of local organizations in defining um, what role women should play in security forces. And I just, um, I'd like to get the, maybe some more opinions from the panel on um, how important that is um, and how routes for dialogue might be opened um, to do that. I think it can be a very challenging thing. I had a, a professor um, in college when I was a young woman tell me that every woman um, defines her own feminism. And at the time, I thought it was a ridiculous statement. But the more longer I am a woman, um, <laughs> the more I find that to be true. Um, and just in even working among the NATO forces, looking at the different roles that women play within the different NATO forces, how we bring um, a comprehensive discussion or how we bring an inclusive discussion to um, defining what we think 
gender roles should be, not just in Afghanistan, but other places, and how you open those routes of dialogue in your experience. Thank you. Um, if I could also provide a, a shameless um, commercial for the DOD Inspector General, we will be publishing a report on the Afghan border police that may be of interest to this audience in the next couple weeks. Thank you. We'll find that online. All right, lots of good questions. Who's going to kick us off? Uh, Megan. Perhaps to respond on, just quickly on this question of monitoring. I think, yes, civil society organizations, women's groups um, in some countries have been playing that role of monitoring um, government institutions and um, security sector institutions on how well they're meeting gender commitments. Um, we can see this, for example, in some of the police station visitor schemes that um, operate in different countries, which, I mean, generally actually is a broader alliance of civil society organisations going into police stations, looking at the sort of facilities they have, including facilities to deal with um, women who, who present as victims or complainants. I think um, we need to be conscious, though, that it can be very difficult to play it a monitoring role unless there's some formal recognition of that role because if there's no formal recognition you often simply can't really get access to the information you need so you might be able to do um, surveys on street corners you might be able to do some sort of citizen surveys of people's experiences with security sector institutions but you really want to be able to get get data on for example how many female and male personnel are there What's the outcome of complaints? You know, what proportion of domestic violence complaints, if you're talking about the police, gets um, prosecuted and what the outcomes are? So what we really want to see is some um, institutionalisation of the role of civil society as monitors to really facilitate that happening. That's a, a very great comment you make because we have an example in Afghanistan uh, uh, local civil society organization called Equality for Peace and Democracy, and Hosai Wardak is actually at uh, USIP at the moment as a senior expert. Their organization took a challenge where they were following two ministries, I believe the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health, and tried to monitor both ministries or, or both ministries' uh, budget and the expenditures of that budget to figure out whether they were, you know, fulfilling the commitments that they were making to provide the services. Um, of course, it was funded and supported, and when the funding stopped, so did the project. Um, but that's definitely, again, a role that civil society can play, provided that there's a, a, a mechanism in place where they have, you know, a long-term commitment, not necessarily through funding mechanisms, but through the infrastructure so that when the government's you know, the government offices do receive these civil society people, they're not just treated as, oh, you money-making machines. Because honestly, <laughs> you know, you said embryonic NGOs or civil society. It's true. A lot of organizations that are especially brewing up right now, most of them are starting organizations because it's the easiest way to make money. It's really a business. Uh, so there needs to be a real honest search or, or clarification from all of us to know who's, who's the right person or people doing the work and who are just doing it for the name or for the money and the grants that are available. That distinction is hard to make, but it needs to be made before we can um, ask somebody to monitor. Uh, and in response to the uh, question about using Islamic principles to combat um, extremism, you know, this is a very, uh, personally, it's very dear and near to me because as a Muslim, as an Afghan, as a woman, um, I know that many of the challenges on the ground that I saw and continue to see is that Islam is continuously misused by one group or another. Um, you know, the terrorists say we're playing, you know, doing a jihad to get rid of the infidels, and in their opinion, the the, the government, the infidels, um, are saying we're trying to get rid of terrorism. You know, our fight is for Allah. So who's Who's really doing it for Allah? We don't know. You know, the common citizens have a very difficulty understanding who's who's honest. 
Um, and then you add on top of that, it's a over 90% illiterate society, men and women. Um, yes, we're slowly you know, raising those statistics up, but it's still you know, very, very high. And you add to the illiteracy the component of culture and tradition overpowering religion, even though you know, uh, living there for 10 years, I saw and I know that Afghans will get up and kill in the name of Allah or die for the name of Allah. But a lot of the practices that you see on the ground, that, you know, they're clearly going against the very principles of being a Muslim or against, you know, principles of Islam. You just wonder what, you know, what, what is going on. So there needs to be a real uh, serious effort um, and I'm actually mad at Karzai's regime for not addressing this issue 12 years ago, you know, by institutionalizing this whole uh, sector of uh, mullahs or the religious, um, the religious people uh, who run the mosques. Because unfortunately, the mosques are no longer places for just praying in religion. These are unfortunately sometimes the safe havens for bombs and ammunitions that are brought uh, from across borders. And so there needs to be a serious address to it, but you talk to the international community, the development community, they don't want to address religion because that's something you don't want to deal with. You talk to military, it, you know, it brings another can of worms, but the reality is there's a problem. And then you talk to Muslim communities, and I'm sorry uh, you know, if anybody might get mad at this, but. You know, the, the Islamic world, I think, needs to, led by Saudi or, or whichever, what is the other conference, the Islamic um, OS, OIC. OIC, you know, somebody needs to take a stand on the actions, the, the inhumane actions that are happening throughout Muslim nations and make a public statement that this is inhumane. And yet, I don't see any government officially announcing or making that public announcement. So I think it's beyond just small local initiatives. Yes, we did the religious prayers at the shrine, and yes, that can be considered as an activity that may help promote peace and stability within that religious community. But I think the issue is bigger and broader, and it, it deserves attention. But I think people are afraid to touch religion because it is that sensitive. I'll be happy to talk further um, because I'm interested in your work as well. So I hope it addressed it, but I know it's a very, very big topic to discuss. Brenton, add a little bit on the question of, of dialogue. Um, I think that in Tunisia, that is um, at the moment remains the most important venue for pushing forward the ideas we've talked about today and security sector reform in general. Because until the Ministry of Interior, which is predominantly where your problems are, Ministry of Justice is more open. Um, but the Ministry of Interior is just not in a position where it's comfortable discussing um, the details and policies. And, and those few that have gotten in have, have, over a very long period of time, cultivated that relationship. You have to remember that the Ministry of Interior considers its organizational chart to be a state secret. Um, there is no, there are no release figures on how many police officers they are. If you ask how the police, the Ministry of Interior is structured, for example, um, that also is something they can't discuss. So to actually, to, to sort of get a meaningful dialogue in which the Ministry of Interior or police organizations would, would want to openly talk to civil society about some of the challenges they face, I don't think that we're there yet. But in general, the dialogue among civil society actors and with the population at large about the kinds of challenges that they face and the kinds of things that the ministry and the government need to do, I think, is important because it will continue to place pressure on the government to have to meet some of those demands. And one of the biggest issues that we found within, um, within the MOI is how they actually look at reform. For most Ministry of Interior officials, they equate a reform with better pay for the police and better equipment. So if you can just give the police better riot gear, then they won't be so afraid and they won't shoot protesters. And if they stop shooting protesters, then the population will begin to respect them more. And that, that damaged relationship coming out of the Ben Ali regime will be repaired. I'm, I'm simplifying a bit, but ultimately that is sort of their concept of what reform is. So even a discussion of reform and why civil society plays an important role in this and why women in civil society play an important role in this. I think in a place like Tunisia and, and in countries that are undergoing these kinds of transitions in which they really have to rethink the, the purpose and role of some of their security sector institutions could be is a very valuable exercise. 
it's difficult to have an immediate impact, but I think that dialogue is, is essential. Um, just really briefly the, to the question of, you know, what do you do when a government um, isn't interested? I think that's really why we've written the Women's Guide is to really, um, you know, empower the grassroots so that they can be demanding change. And um, it certainly isn't going to be easy, but uh, to really um, increase the number of individual voices who are trying to carve out um, a space for their voice. And I think for the people in this room, for those of us who are connected to government agencies or other donors, um, you know, there's that, that bottom up. Um, but there's also uh, top down or from the side of you know what can what can donors do to um, to try to uh, twist arms a bit uh, to make um, to make there be um, more space for for women in civil society. Um, just gener again on this question of how do you create change, the the question about how to have a comprehensive dialogue on gender in NATO. Um, not exactly sure we have the answer to that. <laughs> Very interested in speaking about how to do that, but um, I think uh, one thing, and I think this goes as well for DOD, um, what I've seen more, I mean, again, needs to be top down and, and bottom up. So the doctrine and the directives, 40-1 and um, everything else needs to be there, but then you need to, you need to have, you know, um, folks in the field who are coming back and saying that this is really important. So more standardized after action reporting that actually filters up into chain of command. I think that there are really great important lessons that are out there and they're not captured. Um, and I think that that's where you really win hearts and minds of, of folks coming back from deployments and missions saying, look, this actually worked for me. This was the value that, um, that was had when I met with the civil society group. And then, um, you know, teasing out um, how, um, how, how, we, how they then um, do business differently as a result of that. But I think those stories need to be captured more comprehensively. Thanks. All right, we're going to start wrapping up, and I'm going to ask our panelists if they have closing thoughts or um, statements they want to make. And I just wanted to share briefly also on the question of civil society um, oversight. That was actually one of the reasons why we collectively created the US Civil Society Working Group on Women, Peace, and Security, because people like the great Sharon Kotak in our uh, audience today were working inside the government on creating a US national action plan. And we wanted to say very much that we as civil society think we have a role that should be recognized in overseeing and holding our own government accountable, even here in the United States. And we actually had a lot to learn from um, from similar groups in other countries, including Afghanistan, which had, um, instead of an interagency working group, they had a steering committee, for example, so that women from civil society could be on it. Uh, so there's a lot of sharing among civil society that I think we also need to be doing in terms of ways that we can, we can uh, perform that oversight. But as you were saying, Megan, it really starts with recognition of the role and access to information. And thank God our, or our government's uh, org charts aren't considered national security issues, but uh, there's still a few bumps along the way. So does anyone want to make some closing comments or, or final reflections? Um, I guess I'll, I'll just say really encourage everybody to look at the, the Women's Guide, even if you are not a woman. Um, <laughs> make, Bob, make Bob happy. Um, there is just a, a, a tremendous amount of um, a valuable information making the case for inclusion. Um, and as, as Jackie said, uh, you know, we're, the guide is, is focused um, towards um, women activists, but, um, but we know that the, other, the folks who sit on the other side of the table also need um, tips and guidance about how to facilitate those conversations. Um, and we're, we're eager to explore how, how to make that happen. So um, please uh, give it a read and um, think about how it can be useful to you in your work. We sure can. Yeah, I was going to mention that because it hasn't come up so far. It's available already um, on our website in English and French, and we're working on an Arabic translation, which will obviously be very useful to those of us working in North Africa, and also working on a Bosnian translation um, in partnership with Bosnian civil society organizations we work with. And I know Inclusive Security is looking for funds to do a diary version. And, I mean, of course, we would love to see it being translated into lots of other languages. So if anyone is interested in, in pursuing that and thinks they may have ideas about funding that sort of project, do get in touch with us. And this is great. I, I would add um, that I haven't mentioned is that I'm also involved in a new initiative called the Women's Regional Network, which is a group of women working uh, from Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India together to address the issue of insecurity and corruption. And I... We are actually having our steering committee meeting in Kabul um, in about two weeks' time, so I'll be sure to share the toolkit with the whole regional team because it's important when we talk about security, 
sometimes and a lot of times it's not just that one country. We need to keep the regional yes. um, approach in mind when we're addressing security because we might bring security to Afghanistan, but what do you do you know, to the issues of our neighbors um, uh, surrounding us? So it's crucial that that regional perspective is in place when we address uh, such hardcore issues. Great. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Really want to thank USIP for hosting us today, uh, DCAF for traveling from Geneva, Kareen and Bob, of course, for participating from USIP, and all of you for coming. And I think we talked a lot about narratives today, um, and I feel like I got a lot of good talking points and, and good reminders, and I hope that all of you, if anyone asks you where you were this morning, you say that you were an event about strengthening the security sector, not about uh, women or about gender. <laughs> Uh, so the narrative begins with each of you, and, and we really appreciate you, uh, you being here and, and talking with us. So thank you very much. Thank you.